Coming up, NASA astronaut Nicole Mann will make history this fall when she becomes the first Native American woman in space. Tribes fight for food sovereignty, plus a wall that heals. I am Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amarawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. Opposition figure Raila Odinga says that he will challenge the results of Kenya's close presidential election this week. That comes as William Ruto, the country's current deputy president, was declared the winner in Tuesday's election. Ruto brings a new uncertainty to East Africa's most stable democracy. Leaders everywhere have pleaded for calm to continue in a nation with a history of deadly post-election violence. A scuffle began with voters and commissioners at the venue before the announcement was even made. Speaking to his supporters, Odinga says that he does not want anyone to take the law into their own hands. The country now faces weeks of disputes and the possibility that the Kenyan Supreme Court will order another election. In New Zealand, a river's personhood status is offering a hopeful future for increased sovereignty for Maori communities. In 2017, New Zealand passed a groundbreaking law granting personhood status to the Wanganui River. The law declares that the river is a living whole from the mountains to the sea, incorporating all of its physical and metaphysical elements. And to the Maori people, the river has already been long seen as a living force. Five years after the law was passed, the Associated Press asked Maori people how the new status is affecting them. Gerard Albert is a lead Maori negotiator in the treaty settlement. He said that because of the river's personhood status, Maori people had to be consulted when a local council tried to build a bridge across the river. He said the fish clan, whose area was affected, didn't have a problem with the bridge, but they had a problem with the lead-up to it. Now the expectation is that the process will never happen that way again. The Wanganui River deal is among dozens of settlements forged in recent years. The Native Women's Association of Canada is calling for the Canadian government to negotiate a rapid return for Dawn Walker. The Okanese Cree woman is being held in an Oregon jail after fleeing to the United States with her seven-year-old son. APTN's Leanne Sanders reports. The Native Women's Association of Canada is calling on the federal government to negotiate the rapid return of Dawn Walker. The organization argues it's in the best interests of all concerned that she be allowed to quickly address the charges of parental abduction and public mischief that she faces in Saskatoon. Association President Carol McBride says the Walker case illustrates the frightening reality many Indigenous women face. Can you imagine um, what our sisters go through throughout this country? Um, you know, I mean, that horrible, horrible word, genocide. And that's what all these actions lead up to, genocide. The association cites the findings of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, which found that violence directed at Indigenous women in Canada is genocide, and that much of that violence is committed by domestic partners. Darlene Rose Okimasum Seacott with Women Walking Together in Saskatoon also said it's important that Walker be returned to the city as quickly as possible. An extradition request um, to bring our loved one back to our country around, you know, the support of um, community and colleagues and friends and especially the family um, because we know what that experience is like 
in the judicial justice system. Both organizations are concerned that officials in the U.S. and Canada will not fully take into account the systemic circumstances involved when Indigenous women believe they're not safe. This is not a place, uh, a, a, a safe place to live as Indigenous women. That's that's the the part I'm going on, and that's the part that I'm going to fight for. Um, you know that the government starts moving on these calls for action. Don Walker said she fled Saskatoon because she feared for her and her son's safety. She and her son Vincent had been the subject of a week-long search when she was located in Oregon City. Vincent has been brought back to Canada and is with his father. Walker is scheduled to appear in an Oregon court on September 7th. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, food sovereignty and the pandemic, and a wall that heals. But first, this is an interview you don't want to miss. A Wailaki citizen has her eyes set on the floating laboratory in space, the International Space Station. We'll be right back. When the SpaceX Crew-5 mission blasts into outer space this fall, you are definitely going to want to watch. That's because a citizen of the Round Valley Indian tribes is set to become the first Native American woman in space. ICT editor Jordan Bennett Begay interviewed the NASA astronaut Nicole Mann. Let's watch. Why did you want to become an astronaut? Why would you not want to become an astronaut? Um, <laughs> Uh, it was a little bit later on in life, actually, that I uh, realized that being an astronaut was an opportunity and, uh, and something that I could do. And I, to be honest, I didn't understand when I was younger what astronauts actually did. And, and so once I you know, became a little more educated and, and learned of these possibilities, uh, I was all in. And uh, you know, I was excited to be a part, I think, of this team that explores space and human exploration, right? And the, and the development of things that are gonna benefit humans back on earth. To me, that makes me very excited. And I just feel fortunate to be a part of it. And that's, no, it's really great. And can you tell us uh, in a nutshell, like what is the goal of this mission? Yeah, so the Crew-5 mission is a SpaceX uh, spacecraft called Dragon. It will launch from Kennedy Space Center in Florida with myself and three other crew members. And we will launch to the International Space Station, which is a floating laboratory that lives 250 miles above our planet Earth. And we will live on board for six months to execute our mission, which will involve around 250 scientific experiments, hopefully a couple of spacewalks to make some upgrades to the space station, um, hope, hopefully some cool photos and outreach events um, to, to share our mission with folks back on Earth. And Dragon will stay attached the entire time. And then when we complete our mission, after six months, we'll go on board, uh, come back to planet Earth and splash down off the coast of Florida. Uh, what are you looking forward to when you get up to the space station? Is there one uh, that you're really excited for? There's a lot I'm excited for. Of course, I hope to do a spacewalk because we do a lot of training for that, of course. Uh, but there's some really cool science on board. One of my, um, one of the ones that I'm looking most forward to is called the Biofabrication Facility. And it is literally 3D printing human cells, which to me sounds so futuristic, right? Uh, and the concept is that, you know, pr printing and growing these cells on Earth is difficult because of the force of gravity. And so in space, you're able to do this with a much more intact structure of the cell. Um, the end goal is printing human organs. Uh, we're not there yet. However, we have successfully printed some uh, heart cells as well as part of a uh, meniscus of a knee. And so this uh, facility has flown and then come and, and printed cells and then come back to earth. They made changes, they learned, they flew again, came back to earth, they made changes and they're about to fly it again. So that'll be our chance to uh, participate. 
Wow, I'm so mindful right now. And I would be just Isn't that amazing. Right. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, and then from what I understand, you, and what you told me too is that you're the spacecraft commander. Can you tell yes. tell us like what the duties are of your role? Absolutely. So as commander, I'm ultimately responsible for the mission of Crew Dragon. And I have uh Josh Cassida is my pilot. And then we have two of our international partners. I have Koichi Wakata is our mission specialist. He's from Japan. And I have Anna Kinkana. She's a mission specialist and she's from Russia. So together, the four of us will uh, you know, fly the spacecraft to station. Um, but it'll be uh, my job is overall you know, mission commander working with Josh as the pilot to uh, execute the, uh, the flying portion and the uh, mission itself. I feel like you're like the quarterback of the team in doing directions. <laughs> That's actually a good way to think of it. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I read too that you've been an astronaut since 2013. Um, and I can only imagine the training you went through. Um, what was the most challenging and enjoyable parts of your training? Oh, you know what? It's the same. So the most challenging is definitely the spacewalks training. So you, they put you in a spacesuit, uh, just like you would be in space, uh, and they blow you up like a balloon um, so that you are about four PSI uh, differential above Earth's presser, pressure. And that's what it's like when you go out the door in vacuum. Then they put you in this huge pool to simulate microgravity and use a team of divers and weights and foam. Now, inside the pool is a life-size mock-up of the International Space Station, or most components of it. And so you crawl around this kind of like scuba diving, kind of like a jungle gym um, to make modifications, do maintenance on the space station. But each time you move, you're working against the pressure of that suit of that 4.3 PSID. So it's like a marathon. The training run is six hours long. You're physically exhausted. You're mentally exhausted. You're done at the end of one of these runs. But everybody says it is the most realistic training for doing a spacewalk in space. And being under the water and 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 climbing along the space station and doing these tasks, it is it is incredible. It is some of the coolest training I think that that we do. And uh, hopefully, I'll have an opportunity to do that in space for real. You will likely be the first Native woman in space. How yes. do you feel about that? You know, I think it's very exciting. I think it's important that we communicate this. Uh, you know, to our community so that other, you know, Native kids, if they thought maybe that this was not a possibility or or to realize that some of those barriers that used to be there, right, are really starting to get broken down. So no matter your gender or your ethnicity, you know, or your religion, these, these are possibilities here for the taking and hopefully um, our kids are able to recognize that. Okay. And can you tell us a little bit about the community you come from and um, just your background? I grew up in Northern California, and so my background is a Wailaki tribe, which is part of the Round Valley uh, tribes from Covalo, which is up um, Northern California, like above San Francisco area. And so a lot of my extended family still lives in that area. And they have to be so excited for you. I can only imagine uh, them yeah. sitting all around the TV or even down there watching you take off. <laughs> yes, they are. They're very excited. <laughs> I know that everyone is able to take personal items into space. And then John Harrington, the first native man who went up to space, took a couple items. What are you taking? Well, I'm definitely taking, uh, I have some special gifts for my family, which I can't say because they're surprised. Uh, definitely taking like my wedding rings. Um, and then I have this dream catcher that my mother gave me when I was very young. Um, and it's kind of always stayed with me um, throughout my time. And that's a little... A little piece of, of me that, I, that I'll take just on a personal note. We should note that Nicole Mann is in the running to be selected to go to the moon. In December of 2020, NASA announced her as one of 18 astronauts being considered for the Artemis mission. We'll be right back. Since the 
Vietnam Memorial was created in Washington, D.C., millions of Americans have visited and paid their respects to the family and friends who served in that war. But many Native families have not had the chance to go visit. But now the wall can come to them. The Wall That Heals is a three-quarter scale replica of the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Next week, that exhibit will be on display in northern Arizona. Let's take a look. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund many years ago created a replica of the wall that travels to communities around the country that we call the wall that heals. This mobile replica really is about taking the names home to communities large and small to allow people to have that same kind of healing experience, to come and show their respect, to remember those 58,000 whose names are on the wall, as well as the 2.7 million Vietnam veterans who served who returned home. It's a chance to look back and pay their respects to those who answered the call of service to their country, especially those who made the ultimate sacrifice. To be able to take this around to communities that may not even know anything about the wall or the war, especially for the young kids to come out and see these things and get educated on it. People need to know what these 58,000 plus gave their lives for, whether they want to hear about it or not, they need to know. Joining us today to talk about the replica of the Vietnam Wall, Vietnam Wall is Jerry DeCola. She's a former chairman of the Tonto Apache tribe, which is located in Payson, Arizona, where the replica will be set up in a city park soon. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So as we mentioned, this wall is going to be in your neck of the woods very soon. What do you think that it'll mean to tribal citizens and to the city of Payson? Well, first of all, we're honored, uh, the tribe and the town of Payson and the businesses are honored to have the wall that heals to come to Payson. Uh, we are very respectful of those that had served in the war and gave their ultimate sacrifice, both men and women. Uh, the replica will be able to be open to all people, natives and non-natives. <clears throat> and for those that are not able to travel to Washington, D.C., they can come to Payson, which is centrally located in Arizona, and uh, they can come and uh, pay tribute and honor to the names that are on the wall which I'm sure include a lot of natives from all over. That's a great segue into my next question, which of course is maybe if you could talk about how much in your tribal nation, um, you know, citizens had served in the Vietnam War and how you remember their legacy today. We are a very small tribe. We're the smallest tribe in the state of Arizona. Our population is 175. Currently, the only veterans that we have uh, well, a, a Vietnam veteran is our uh, my cousin's husband, Pat Morgan, who served in the Vietnam War. He's a non-native, and he still lives with us. And he has memories that are not too good, but he's able to get the counseling and the help that he needs, services that are provided to him to help him to cope with this. And it's our honor that, you know, that we that he's here and and we celebrate him along with the others during Veterans Day. And we have extended family that that have fought that were in the war, but they didn't fight in the Vietnam War. When this wall comes to pace and aside from actually being able to see it, what other kinds of things can people expect um, to see when they visit? Well, they have what they call an education center, which would be where they could go in and view the pictures and stories of, of Vietnam, what all they, they went through, and and they will have names and pictures as well. And as we opened this interview, we said that um, this is especially important for Indigenous families who maybe don't have the means to go to Washington, D.C. to visit this wall. For those people, what do you ultimately hope that they're taking away from it? Well, I hope that they're able to to come and view the wall and, and again, realize that Native people had paid a role in, in, in given their ultimate sacrifice. And I'm sure that they have names of the beloved ones there. And 
the wall that heals will help them to, I believe, to come to terms with what all took place. And they could do the rubbing of the names on the wall as well. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate learning so much about this. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Some tribal leaders say the coronavirus pandemic taught them many lessons. For the people on the Walker River Paiute tribe in Nevada, one of those lessons included food sovereignty. After figuring out creative ways to get food to its citizens, tribal leaders then went on to sign a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They are the first tribe to have such an agreement. And joining us today to talk about the program is Amber Torres. She's the Walker River Paiute tribal chairman. Welcome, Chairman Torres. Good morning. Thank you. So I want to go back to a point in the pandemic in which we were all a little scared to go out to the grocery store and buy food. Um, what solutions did the tribe come up with to help those citizens? Yes, definitely. Thank you for the wonderful question. You know, immediately when we had heard about the pandemic hitting, we shut down our reservation borders um, to make sure that our people were healthy and safe. We also experienced, you know, hoarding that was going on all around us. We are a very rural, desolate reservation located um, basically in the middle of nowhere and we're a, a food desert. So we actually put into place a small community store. We arranged our technology center to become our new community store where we um, accessed uh, fruits, vegetables, meat, and our constituents could order and drive through and pick up their orders. You know, from there, it then flourished into um, a, a relationship and a partnership with the Food Bank of Northern Nevada. We opened a food pantry. And from there, we've uh, been able to acquire the funding for a um, food and nutrition wellness facility that we're working on. And we actually put some CARES funding aside to start our own food sovereignty project and hoping to eventually 638 the FDIPR uh, or food distribution on Indian reservations program to make sure that our people don't go hungry. We know that so often in Indian country, tribal nations are located in food deserts. I mean, you just mentioned the same. Do you think that the coronavirus pandemic almost spurred you to get into action on something it sounds like you maybe wanted to do for a while? Yeah, definitely. We've we've wanted to have this vision in mind of making sure that our people don't have to leave the reservation and don't go without um, you know, so the the funding that came down to Indian country is probably the most that we're going to see in our our lifetime. And, you know, we really jumped on board with making sure that we didn't get into this situation again, um, you know, where there was no access to food or if we should ever get in a catastrophic event that our people had to leave the reservation for the for their needs. And so, you know, it really allowed us the opportunity to hit the ground running and then flourish from there and keep building onto this program, you know, again, for the next seven generations to take on and build off of. And when you're out in the community and talking to tribal citizens, how much do they say that this helped them? You know, it's it's been tremendous feedback on, you know, how much, um, how important it is to make sure that our elders and our youth and just our community overall is taken care of and has their needs addressed. And, you know, we've gotten exceptional feedback on how many um, houses we are um, taking care of and how many uh, families we're feeding. And the, you know, they love the access to fresh fruits and vegetables and just the variety of different foods that we're able to put in, as well as, you know, also being the first tribal nation nationally to acquire a local uh, food purchase agreement and allow us to work with our partners around the Great Basin area to access foods and hopefully traditional foods in the future. Absolutely. Well, I want to talk about your um, historic cooperative agreement with the USDA. Tell us about that. Yes, definitely. Like I said, um, and just kind of touched on is we were the first tribal nation to acquire the local food purchase agreement. You know, I have um, exceptional staff here at Walker River that just saw the need and have the drive to make things happen. 
and you know work very very hard to make sure that again all of our tribal citizens as well as our community have everything um, that they need to flourish and be successful and so you know they they wrote the grants they went after it and they were able to acquire it and now that allows us the access to work with our local farmers ranchers producers and specifically native producers um, to acquire the foods that we need. Um, again, because we are a food desert, we're 40 miles from your nearest um, store and make sure that we're keeping those dollars in Indian country as well as um, meeting our people's needs. Absolutely. Well, if you're looking five years down the line, 10 years down the line, where do you hope that your tribal nation is at with food sovereignty? You know, just making sure that we are still continuing to put the needs and the dollars into this program, you know, pretty soon we're going to have this big, beautiful facility and, you know, hopefully just building more programs, more wellness, more mental health, um, and more access for our people to fresh fruits, vegetables, hopefully our traditional foods, you know, um, and things that our people need to, again, just ultimately be successful and, you know, Again, I also want to be looked at as a best practice on how you can make it happen. We've had staff that wear 10 different hats, but, you know, got all these things in place for our people and show our people that they are our most precious commodity and that we are here to serve and protect them as well. Chairman Amber Torres, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Peace out you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.